and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on it like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news.
uh, look at our lives and think of is there something that we need to remove from our lives to help grow our intimacy with God? Is there something we need to add into our lives to help uh, sustain us and, and help us to draw closer to God? To help prepare our hearts to hear the gospel story again. And ultimately, to build intimacy with God. As the season Lent is, is mostly modeled after Jesus' 40 days of wandering in the wilderness, being tested by the devil. But I want to start a little bit earlier than that, with Act 1 as being Jesus' baptism, where Jesus is revealed as the Messiah in the anointing and call of God. Jesus' baptism to me is a curious, curious thing. Uh, John's baptism, as, as he, uh, he offered it to his fellow Jewish peoples is really an opportunity for repentance, for cleansing. And many people, I'm sure you have wondered, uh, if Jesus lives a sinless life, what does he need to repent for? Why is Jesus being baptized? Another gospel gives us uh, the mysterious answer of to fulfill all righteousness. And I don't know about you, but that doesn't answer half the questions I have about why Jesus was baptized. But two things aren't nearly as mysterious First, uh, the Holy Spirit and the voice of God, the Father in heaven, and Jesus all together boldly seem to be saying that Jesus is to be singled out as special, as having a special calling and mission on his life, unlike any who had come before him. This is the Messiah long foretold, the favored one of God. And one thing that's not as obvious to us, uh, people who live so far away and are from a different time, is the significance of the vacation. They are on the Jordan River, and that's not merely a matter of circumstance. This is actually a, quick, a really dramatic detail. This is a place that God's people once first entered the Promised Land, following God, uh, following Joshua as he led them into this place. Also missed by those that read the Bible only in English, Joshua, Joshua and Jesus are essentially the same name. And Jesus here is functioning as a new Joshua. On a spiritual journey. And so John's call to, to the people of God was a call to start over, to leave the land behind and enter the waters of the Jordan, and to re-enter the promised land again with a new commitment and a new openness to God. And so John preached about repentance, but the spiritual journey of repentance uh, he helped start was actually uh, something that was marked by a physical journey. John offered God's people a new start, a do-over, if you will. But if you wanted a fresh start with God, you had to go on a journey back to the beginning. The, the beginning of where God had once before led God's people to experience something new. And I think John's baptism, uh, Jesus' baptism by John, was also about showing us that God was offering the world a do-over. Showing us in a new way that God himself had come with us to share on that journey with us. And Act 2 uh, brings us to Jesus' experience of passing through the wilderness and learning to trust God. And the Spirit leads Jesus into the harshness of the desert, into a wild place, where the faces uh, of the devil taunt him, where he faces the enemy of humanity in a state of weakness. And we learn about who Jesus is as he clings to the truth of his identity, as the Messiah and the truth of God's promises. And I want to get back to that a little bit later, maybe in this series. And then finally we find ourselves in Act 3. We see the next phase of Jesus' spiritual journey, where he emerges from the desert. He begins sharing the gospel and helps others start again with God, just like John the Baptist did. But instead of uh, staying out by the outskirts, he comes back in to God's people. Jesus really storms on the scene at this point. And even after John the Baptist is locked up and, and eventually uh, is killed, Jesus keeps on meddling. He keeps carrying on the work long after John has, is gone. And he has brought some of that wilderness back with him, I think, into the mundane existence of humanity. The time is now, Jesus says. The kingdom of God has come. Repent and believe the good news. I've uh, preached before on uh, repentance and talked a lot about the, the Greek and Hebrew words that have to do with repentance and how they have to do with a process of exchange. 
Repentance has its original basis as a money changing term, and that might be confusing to you, but I find it to be really something that speaks to me, because Jesus' call is a call to come and, and enter the kingdom of God. And so in the currency exchange, you see uh, an exchange of the currency of one kingdom for the currency of a new kingdom. The, the currency of the kingdom of the world for the currency of the kingdom of God. And it's a call to live into the abundance of God's upside-down economy and God's very different kingdom. And I could preach about that all day long. But really, I want to focus on something else about repentance. Repentance as a fresh start with God. And when you hear the word repent, uh, it sounds harsh. It's one of those words like submit or obey. That there's these little hairs on the back of our neck, and they just kind of start to pop out. Don't they? They kind of bristle a little bit and stand on end. Because there's something within us that wants to resist that. Well, repentance, as God envisions it, is not just an ultimatum to turn or burn, as it's commonly characterized. It's an invitation to start over again on your journey with God. It comes from a place of truth, but it also comes from a place of love. And so make no mistake, the change is what's expected and commanded here. But at its core, and, and to the Jewish people of Jesus' day, repentance was clearly patterned after the lessons learned in God's people's journey uh, around Mount Sinai and off in the desert. Repentance was a call to walk again in freedom from slavery, the slavery of sin and the slavery of self-destruction. It was a call to pursue a new destiny and to receive an abundant share of the goodness of God's will for us. You might ask yourself, well, how do, we, how do we get there? I think we get there through humility, through recognizing our need for God. We get there by way of repentance and following Jesus past the boundary waters and on a new journey pointing to the cross and ultimately to the victory of God. And I believe that Lent can be just this kind of opportunity. I believe it starts for us in similar ways as we see it starting for Jesus. The baby steps on a spiritual journey are putting ourselves back at square one, listening for that voice of God, and once again accepting our identity as children of God. But that's not all there is to it. Even inside the promised land, Jesus spent his time in the desert, being pruned and being tested and learning to trust God in the place of a wilderness and weakness. As much as most people today, there's a lot of people on TV, TV preachers and stuff that want to inspire you and they want you to, to they want to gloss over all the hard stuff in the spiritual life and just focus on God's promises. And, and in my experience and in scripture, I see that whenever God calls his people to do something amazing, it's not going to go uncontested. There's an enemy out there who wants to steal, steal and kill and destroy and at some point, we need to go from taking our little toddler baby steps to walking, to taking some responsibility for pursuing our own spiritual maturity. Nobody can do that for you. It's not possible. And putting God in the center of our lives is something that we each have to do for ourselves, but something that we try to do together. And lastly, the, the last act here, we see that the spiritual life, the spiritual path, isn't something that just stops with us. We can't keep the call and the fruits and the blessings of God all to ourselves. We must share them. We must be fruitful and multiply. And other people need to know that God is real, that God loves them and wants them to be free. Other people need to know that they're not walking alone. They need to see through the mirages of their desert and understand the spiritual struggle that's before them and how God through us extends Jesus' invitation to a new life in through what he did on the cross, how he overcame sin and, and death and the works of the devil and how he brought us victory. And so my sermon is going to be a little bit short today, um, and maybe you're thankful for that. <laughs> but I want to put the ball in your court this morning. I want to invite you to begin Lent by doing something silly and quite literally out of the box. And if you feel led and are physically able, I want you to consider uh, physically doing something as you pray for a new start with God. No, I don't want you to go down to the river, but I do want you to invite you to go outside of the building. 
Uh, I know there's some new people with us, and I just want to share a little bit about what, what we typically do after the sermon and maybe see how this is a little bit different. So typically we have a time of open worship, which is a time of waiting for God, a time of listening for God's spirit. And if someone feels led, they would stand and speak, and sometimes it's silent, and that's okay. It's a time of being gathered together by God. But this morning, we're going to do something a little bit different. I want you to, to pray and seek and, and find out that, that voice of God and what it might be saying to you this morning. I want you to go outside and listen for God, and then I want you to re-enter back into the sanctuary a second time, and then come and experience God in open worship. If anyone wants some special prayer for repentance or forgiveness or for healing, or just feels like they're struggling or walking along, or maybe they have a call of God on their life, or something that they feel like God wants to do in them, then I invite you to come back in and just put your arms up. I mean, you can speak and share in open worship like we normally do, but I want to invite you to ask for prayer by doing this. And if you see someone come near you who is asking for prayer, if they want to talk about it, let them help you guide your prayers a little bit. If they're not comfortable talking about it, I just want you to put your hands on them and just pray for them. I believe that God wants us as a body to receive a special blessing this morning, something new. And it's not something that we experience only as individuals, it's something that we have to experience together as a community, as a people who are chasing after Jesus together. Lent is an opportunity for spiritual pruning. And as this bracelet I'm wearing that many of us are wearing today for 50 days of prayer says, it's a time to, to, to boldly declare that we are entering into a time of of breaking up fallow, fallow ground in our lives and seeking after God. And the Holy Spirit may be calling you to add something new to your walk of faith, or to take something away that stands in the way of chasing after intimacy with God. And sometimes that means putting ourselves before God in a new way to hear His voice again. Sometimes that means trusting Jesus in a desert experience and taking that next scorching step to follow Him to freedom to come back to the same place, maybe the same church, maybe the same life, but with a different perspective. Sometimes it means helping others to begin again with God, or even to recognize that we ourselves need to begin again with God in humility and in repentance. So where are you in the journey? They say sometimes that the, the farthest distance of something to travel is that 18 inches between the head and the heart. It's the courage to take that next step or the, the first step to do something with God. And I want to just uh, get you outside of the church building for a second, and, and I want you to find God there and re-enter. Let the Holy Spirit gather us back together as the people of God and break down some of the walls that we have been putting up between ourselves, walls that have paralyzed the hands and feet of Jesus that we are called to be to. I'm going to go ahead and have Joanna put the instruction slide. I know it was complicated, um, but you can see here there's kind of a part one and a part two of kind of going to the river, so to speak, and coming back with God. So if you feel led and if you're physically able this morning, go ahead and do that. Uh, it's okay if you can't or you don't feel led, but I just want to invite you as we begin our Lenten journey to do something a little bit different to mark this time to open yourself up to what God might do in you.